Hello everyone, I'm Trestic44, also known as Falai, and welcome to this Let's Play of Pillars of Eternity. Last episode, we went through Old Song District and learned that, uh, there are a couple quests that need to be, that, uh, well, we took care of what we could see there, but it seems that the gods will still want us to do things, so we should probably get quests from them so that we can handle other things. Let's head in to Ter Evron now. Okay. Let's take a look around. Bookcase, Book of the Hunt. Da -da 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 -da. Nothing notable, I don't think. Final Journal of Jonas. Nothing special there. Nothing special there. Luminescent Audra Shard. Shattered and charred stone block a stone blocks the passage into sun and shadow. Well, this is interesting. Magnificent. Skane Rimmergond Andra, Barath Hylium Magran Galloway Abaddon. Nothing happens when you approach Wodica's shrine. A piercing ring fills your ears as you near Whale's shrine. There is no other response. In the nearby constellation, you can make out the shape of a strange horned beast. From time to time, you think you sense a faint chill emanating from the shrine itself. Pray to Rimmergund. You kneel before the shrine and prepare to recite the ritual words. Oh. So, okay, let's see if we can find the ritual words for Rimmergond. Obviously, it's one of the books. Let's see. This must be it. You can only show them the symbol of Rimmergond, the bone wipe. All right, okay. Don't think that actually helps very much. Let me see if I can figure this out. All life ends in stillness. You feel a sudden gust of cold air as if the shrine were bursting into wintry life. The frigid wind cuts through you like a sharpened blade and darkness encroaches upon the edges of your sight. You kneel and close your eyes. As you pray, the blackness fades to white, and a howling wind fills your ears. The vision that slowly resolves itself is of a broad, frozen plain. You see a procession of elves in the distance, periodically fading into and emerging from the whiteness. They trudge over snowbanks, their heads down against the driving winds. I know this place. This is the white that wins. As they trek fa past you, one man bundled in furs turns his head. You headed for Noonfrost and the frost hewn Breach, too? Before you can answer, he's lumbered ahead. You follow the caravan, and in a couple minutes you come to a wall of ice. It disappears into the pale emptiness overhead, and stretches as far as you can see in either direction. The elves stop in front of a mirror-smooth section that's framed like a temple door. It seems somehow thinner than the rest of the wall. You can't see what's on the other side, but a debilitating cold emanates from within. The elves pull pickaxes and shovels from their seal-skin packs and begin hacking at the smooth ice, their implements flying through the air in swift, shining arcs. Though they throw their bodies into their labor, not one of them so much as scratches the polished ice. Yet with each blow, something bellows in the distance. Whatever that is, it's huge. And angry. And it's coming our way. Palagina's head whips around to see where the bellowing is coming from. Forget about the elves. We need to be ready to move. She turns again to face you, flexing her hands in the cold air. Or fight. The elves hack away, seemingly oblivious to the, fur to the furious lowing and to the tremors under your feet. 
The snow has risen to your knees. Your legs feel frozen in the drifts. Try to get the elves' attention. You grab the nearest elf by your shoulder, shaking her and yelling over the howling winds. You point in the direction of the booming noise, but she only scowls. Leave us, traveler. We've got to get through. We can't stay on this side any longer. But you haven't even chipped the ice. I know. That's why we've got to keep working. She turns away from you to take another swing. Wait. You watch as the elves continue to work at the ice. They pay no heed to the rumbling roar or the numbing winds. Their movements, however, gradually slow. They labor at the ice with arduously sluggish movements until they finally freeze in place, some mid-swing and others preparing for the next blow. You touch the elf nearest to you and he crumbles into a mound of snow. A final gale blows past, scattering the remains of the elves in a chaotic flurry. You notice a single spiderweb crack in the smooth barrier. It's the only thing that mars the perfect surface of the ice. Whatever's on the other side of the strange doorway, you feel it tugging at you. Only when you look back and see the parallel gashes trailing behind your legs in the snow, do you realize how strong its pull is. My end comes to all things in time. Seal the frost-hewn breach, and instruct the pilgrims in the patience of Remergond. Plug the hole with a handful of snow. You fill your hand with snow and shove it into the crack. It hardens instantly, and a hoary rime grows over the smooth surface of the frozen doorway, fusing it with the rest of the wall. When you take your hand away, a perfect crystal of ice remains in your palm. As you examine the crystal, the vision around you fades, but the unmelting shard of ice remains in your hand. Barath. In the glittering stars of the nearby constellation, you see the grim shape of a skull. Its jaws are open wide as if frozen in a silent stream. Pray to Barath. Hmm. I can guess what some of these are. I don't know the Wodica one. Answer without a question is Wail. Master chokes on his own whip is Skane. All life and stillness is Rimmergond. Sing the ocean sorrow so I may forget my own. That is Andra. Uh, life, live every note of life's song. Hylia. All things can be reforged is Abaddon. Survival begins with strength from within is, uh, probably... What's his name? Galloway, Magran, and Barath are the two I haven't s spoken of. I'm going to guess there is life and death and death in life. There is a rippling shift in the air around you as if some unfelt wind has changed, bringing unexpected warmth. You feel the peculiar weight of an unseen presence and of eyes upon you. You kneel and pray to Barath. Even while your eyes are closed, you see a road that seems to stretch on forever. The stars wheel overhead in a clockwork rotation of constellations, disappearing over the horizon to your left, only to rise on your right. You try to make out the details on either side of the road, but your eyes can't seem to focus. One moment you think you see a meadow blanketed with mist, and another sheer canyon walls. For just an instant you even see waves lapping at the edges of the road. Were you to step into the shifting landscape, you feel certain you would only end up back on the road. You know this is a vision, but the packed dirt feels firm beneath your feet, and the night air cool on your face. You are walking. Your feet seem to carry you forward of their own accord. Something looms ahead of you. As you get closer, you see two stone figures that look strangely familiar. The two faces of Kirono, what we call Berath. She shudders slightly, her feathers ruffling as she peers at the figures with apprehension. You remember the door to Cleobon Rilag and the two figures carved into the mountain next to it. One looks vaguely male, and the other vaguely female. Only a thin layer of flesh covers their skeletal bodies, which twist to face the doorway between them. The doorway, however, is not what you saw in the ruins. It's a skull, gaping and jawless, and as you look on, its open mouth seems to grow. The arms of the two stone sculptures are swept toward the mouth, inviting you in. Enter the skull's mouth. The road continues through the Maw to another shifting landscape surrounded by stars. As you pass through it, you see an identical doorway in the distance. 
A dwarven man stands near it, unmoving. You turn and look behind you, only to see the skull gate you just passed facing you. An elven woman wakes in the road. Like the dwarf, she stands still. Approach the dwarven man. You continue down the road toward him. He looks up as you approach, but you can't tell if he's looking at you or through you. His face is smooth but flaccid, as if the flesh has detached from the muscles underneath. As you look on, his face begins to change. Wrinkles crack at the corners of his eyes. His mouth sinks, carving deep lines from his nose to the corners of his lips. His jowls sag and the loose flesh hangs like dough. He raises his cupped hands. They're covered in blood. He lifts him to his face and smears himself from his newly creased forehead to the waddles of his neck. As he massages the dark, sticky fluid into his skin, the, flesh, the fresh wrinkles disappear. The hanging folds recede and his flesh tightens as if re-adhering to his skull. He lifts his head, and this time you know he's looking at you. His renewed face looks like a mask, artificially smooth and still. Behind it, his black eyes are two hungry pits, yawning like the empty mouths of skulls. Come, make your sacrifice to the ethic knoll. His body blocks the path. He extends a bloody hand toward you. Turn and run. The dwarf seizes you as you flee. You tear your arm from him and his grip gives way with a noise like dried canvas ripping. His skin splits, following a long seam that begins at his arm and stretches the length of his body. Blood gushes forth in such quantities that you can't imagine there was ever anything else in him. Sure enough, as the dwarf empties of blood, he collapses like a desiccated husk. The blood in the path gleams with a thousand souls worth of essence. The essence evaporates, trailing shining filaments into the night sky. Only now that he is dead can you continue onward. The blood pools around your feet and you look up and see the elven woman waiting further down the road. Approach the elven woman. You start toward her. There's something unnatural about the way she stands. She's too still. When you get closer you see that her legs taper into a slender trunk and in place of her feet are gnarled twisting roots. She lifts her face to an invisible sun. Her long golden hair is the color of autumn leaves, and as you look more closely, you realize that her head is actually covered with tendrils and vines sprouting brilliant yellow leaves. Each glimmers with the essence of an entire soul. She gives you a beatific smile. As you look on, the leaves slowly fall from her head and settle at her roots. They melt into the path beneath her, and almost immediately new leaves sprout in the place of the old. She reaches toward you, still smiling as roots spring from her fingertips. Her outstretched arms bar the path. Come, graft your soul to the golden grove. Turn and run. Before you can flee, her roots twine around your shoulder. Yet as they do, they grow rigid and cold. Her outstretched arm petrifies, and as a rough stone bark overtakes her flesh, she can only look on in horror. You break away from her brittle grasp. Her feet are rooted in place, but she twists and writhes as if trying to flee her own dying limb. The petrification reaches her shoulder and spreads down her body, freezing it in a painful arc. It creeps up her neck, and she throws her face skyward like a drowning swimmer. The grayness covers her face, freezing her gasp in stone. Now that she is still and lifeless, you can continue past her. Only the golden leaves on her head remain untouched, and as you watch, they fall one by one to the path below. They shrivel as the shimmering essence fades from them. A voice echoes along the road, barely more than a whisper on the breeze. Return them to the wheel. You lift your gaze and see the skull gate ahead of you on the path. The candles of Tear Evron wink through the open mouth. Okay then. Next we have Hylia. The shrine sits before a bright constellation, its stars forming the oval shape of an egg. A pair of wings sprout from the egg, stretching out to either side. Most likely live every note of life's song. Your words seem to ring in the air, your voice rendered melodic and lilting by some unseen art. You shut your eyes to pray. As you wait in darkness, the world around you changes. You feel sunlight, bright and warm, on your face. A light breeze carries music to your ears. As vivid as these sensations feel, you somehow know they are not real. You look around and find yourself standing in an open-air temple built on a mountain summit. It's filled with elves, orlins, and assorted other kith. Ringing the entire scene is a fringe of trees, their verdant branches filled with birds of all different colors, shapes, and sizes. 
Pelagina takes it all in with squinting eyes and a wry smile. And I'm supposed to feel at home here. Really? Everyone is singularly absorbed in a particular pursuit. And Orlin sits with a canvas, a paintbrush in his hand, and jars of green, blue, and yellow pigments at his feet. An elf and an Amawa standing to, either, standing to the side are locked in conversation, their expressions dancing with delight. Still others scribble stanzas of poetry or crude sketches on sheaves of paper, losing themselves in the delicate minutiae of lines and syllables. You feel the breeze again, and two elves basking in the sunlight shiver. The largest group gathers in the middle of the temple. They sing a lush, chaotic harmony composed of several complementary melodies. Others drift toward the singers in ones and twos, as if buffeted by a gust of wind or a phrase of a song. A ripple passes through the trees. You think it's the wind, but the chirping changes to screeching. Hundreds of birds take to the skies, all headed in one direction. Away. Something must be coming. The devotees glance at the trees, just barely distracted from their activities. But the wind picks up, scattering the, their pages of poetry and art, and ripping the songs from their lips. They look skyward and you follow their gaze. A dark shape blots out the sun. You can't tell what it is, but as it unfolds and expands, it seems to fill the sky. The wind roars over the summit. Seldom a good sign. Before you can flee, a shadow falls over the temple. It begins as a stain in the corner and spreads, blotting out the flagstones. It reaches the nearest kith, a black furred orlin. The darkness swallows her, leaving only a puff of smoke in her place. The two elves that you saw earlier, a man and a woman, flee. You get a brief image of them huddled in the shadow of a mountain. They seem to see you too when they reach out, calling silently after you. The others, however, seem frozen. As the shadow advances, they likewise vanish one by one. The driving gale scatters their ashes and the charred remains of their creations. You look up again at the source of the shadow, but the eclipsed sun forms a blinding corona around the thing. You can't make out any details. You can, however, feel heat. Restore my temple. You look down and find yourself standing next to Hylia's shrine in Ter Ebron. Your pulse still races and your skin is damp with sweat from your strange encounter. Okay. And this one is Galloway. We may have already completed his quest. I'm going to put down a save before we do this one. The only reason I'm doing this is because I don't want to start up a big conversation. Okay, so because doing that last one will effectively complete the quest entirely that we had to do and just bypass learning about it, and start the whole final thing, I'm going to hold off on praying to Galloway until we complete these other quests that we happen to have. So I've done th three of them, we still have three more. So... We have to... So we have Barath, Hylia, and, uh... Rimmergond. Rimmergond needs us to go into Noonfrost and do something about this breach there. So that's something to deal with. Hylia we already know about. We need to deal with the dragon. And Barath has us deal with two figures. One of them is, uh... The Dwarf and the Ethic Knoll. That's going to be an issue. The other could be High Ovate Arona. Often ventures to Elmshore. Hmm. So we'll need to go there. No problem. That'll be something to deal with. But I believe we'll be dealing with those in the next episode. This episode's going on, sh gonna go on shorter, I think. Although. I think since we're here, we can at least try and deal with this guy from the Ethic Knoll. This may not be too good. How is our reputation here, by the way? Okay, the Ethic Knoll don't really like us. Twin Elms were faintly good. Hmm. Let's go in and see. So most likely, it is he all the way up here who we will need to deal with. Aerith clearly wants us to deal with, uh... Yeah. Almost certainly it is this guy. Bareth believes it's time you paid your dues. 
Then he can descend from his mighty pantheon and tell me himself. Actually, that's why I'm here. Since when do the gods send mortals to collect? You don't exactly look like the Pallid Knight. This is the trouble with deities. They meddle in a world that they don't even inhabit. I hope they promised you something better for your next life. And so the fight begins. Slay him first. And he is dead. Now we deal with the others. Well, I'm pretty sure they're going to be pissed off at us, but we're basically killing them all, so what does it matter? Yeah, we've lost reputation with Epic Null for everyone that we kill. This doesn't surprise me. Purgatory, a unique saber. Interesting. Okay, so... Twin Elms we're still an ally with. Ethic Null just hates us now. Although I guess now we can just loot whatever we want and it doesn't matter. Including their main treasure. Hmm, that'll be good. Alright. We'll be killing them all. And looting everything, of course. What is this? Blood Testament. Only usable by Monk, plus two raw damage per wound. Ooh, interesting. I wish we could only get away with killing the one, but it seems like we do have to kill everyone. Which does kind of suck. Flame Blight. I think that's all of them. There you go. Alright, loot all the things. Oh, he's running. And more have been summoned. Alright, we can kill them all. Come on. Couple more here. Oh, that one actually got charmed. Very nice. Now kill him. There you go. It is unfortunate that this is what happens, but I guess it kind of has to. As the gods demand. Then again, these guys are literally blatant. They blatantly sacrifice. Let's go! Yeah, these guys, they're murderers and cause sacrifices and everything, so really it's not... This isn't that horrible a thing. Okay, let's just head all the way back up here so we can clear off the other side before we go into the center. Hello, Zeus. Enjoy the watching here. Well, of the last of this. Once we clear out the rest of this... Oh, boy. Hello. Once we clear out the rest of these, uh, sacrificial murderers, we'll be ending the episode. Lover. Let's go! Come on, get with the murdering already. Can't get a good shot. 
Oh, hi, I didn't see you over there. Let's go. There we go, Earthlight handled. There's that. There's that. Loot the rest of this. Just I'll answer in a bit. And there's that one. You're not gonna last long. And down you go. Is this merchant also basically hostile to us? Surprisingly, no. Word as heads turns to you, but she seems to look past you through clouded eyes. I have heard the screams of the others and smelled their blood in the air. A grim irony that the ethic knoll should perish alongside a millennium of sacrifices. You're doing. Come to fish an old blind woman too, or have you out of their business? We're gonna leave you alone. Okay, with this. And now for the entry hall. Right into here. And there they are. I think there was one more guard up here. Yep, one more. Where are you running to? Get back here. And there we go. All right. Oh, no, wait. One more I didn't see. There we go. Now they're all dealt with. All right. And with uh, an entire sacrificial cult murdered, <laughs> I am going to end this episode here. Next episode, I dare say... We'll go back into Old Song and see about clearing out uh, the Temple to Rimmergond. See about getting that dealt with, at least. Then we'll move on, we'll take a trip to Old Song, we'll go to the North Weald, and we'll take care of as much as we can. But that'll be in the next episode. So until then, I am Chester44, also known as Philae. That is Laniara, Palagina, Dorans, uh... Haravius, Aloth, and Sagani. This has been a Let's Play of Pillars of Eternity, and I shall see you all next time.